So we are on the week that we're talking about atonement, but since we've taken a few weeks off, I want to start class by running through um, a review of the fall semester, just to kind of give us the quick and dirty of where we've been already. So we started talking about God, and God is the creator. God is outside of time and beyond time which means that we relate to God very differently than we relate to any other person because all of our personal relationships are with other people that are inside of time. God sees the entirety of human history from a vantage point beyond it. So while other human beings who are in time change in real time with us, God doesn't change. Our position relative to God changes, but the kind of relationship that we have with God is not one where we can change God's mind. We are in a relationship where we are trying to change in order to be in harmony with God. Now, because God is perfect, so God has the perfection of power, the perfection of happiness, the perfection of love, God cannot gain anything from us, which means that when God created the world, he's not doing that for his own benefit. God creates for the sake of his creatures. So God is creating for our sake, which means that everything that God does is for our benefit. We know God because God chooses to allow himself to be known. Part of that big difference that creature-creator distinction implies God being outside of this whole worldly system does not have to be known by us at all other than through the logical necessity of there being a creator. But God has chosen to show us his character and to have an actual personal relationship with us. So we have Things about God revealed to us through nature, that's general or natural revelation, and through special revelation. So that's what we would think about the prophets, God coming and talking to us, God becoming one of us in Jesus, and then those um, packets of information that God transmits through special revelation being recorded as scripture. So scripture is a codification of special revelation. Um, The two, three terms to remember about God is that God is omnipotent, which means that God is all-powerful, and kind of in there is also God being all-knowing, knowing is part of God's power. God is impassable, which means that God does not suffer, because God has that full perfection. And God is immutable, which means that God is unchanging. Humans, on the other hand, are none of those things. Humans are creatures who are made in the image of God, which means that we share something structural in our nature with God's nature that makes us capable of a relationship with God and also of a rational love. Because remember, God's nature is love. Human beings have the capacity for rational love. That's what it means to be in the image of God. And what I mean by rational love is we know that like, dogs have the capacity for love, but that love is an irrational love. The dogs just love. It's purer than human love, but it's not rational. Humans have the capability to choose to love someone else. So it's not just an instinct. It's not a feeling. We have the capacity to love by choice. And that is how we reflect the image of God. God chooses to love us. Now, though we were made in the image of God, we are in time. So we are not omnipotent. We have limitations. We are passable. We can suffer. 
and we are mutable, we change. That's what it means to be in time, is to have the ability to change. And as a result of those things, that means that we can, we have the capacity to do what God tells us not to do, right? We can turn away from God, and that's exactly the path that we have chosen. So we have fallen into sin. In the face of sin, God shows grace. So grace we defined as the power of the Holy Spirit enabling us to behave and love and serve God. So remember, sin is the willful rejection of God. It is the, in full knowledge, looking at God and saying no. And that breaks our relationship. Grace is God choosing to be in relationship with us anyway. So we talked about grace not being some kind of magic substance, right? Grace is not some witch's brew that God makes up in heaven and pours out on us like magic juice or fairy dust. Grace just is the Holy Spirit running after us, refusing to take our rejection of God as the last word. So we keep telling God to shove off. God keeps running after us anyway. That's grace. The reason God shows us grace is that there was a certain goal that God had for us from the beginning of creation. And that goal was to share in God's own life with God. So remember, God does everything for our benefit and the biggest benefit that we could have is the totality of goodness that is God. Because of sin, there is now a barrier between where we are and us reaching our goal. We need to be saved from the consequences of our own actions. We need to be saved from the state of being that we are in that is on the wrong side of the barrier that we have put up between us and God. God saving us from the consequences of our sins and helping us hop that barrier is salvation. So salvation just is God intervening to allow us to reach the goal God had set for us at creation because in order for us to get there now, we need God to reach down and get us to hop the border that we've erected. Jesus is God's savior. So Jesus is the divine son of God. So when you think about humans are, are here, God is over here, there's a barrier of sin between us. God, the son, hops the barrier to become one of us to pull us over. So Jesus, the center of consciousness that is Jesus Christ, is the eternal Son of God who creates the world. That is the one person that is Jesus Christ. When Jesus became human, that divine Son of God took a human nature and united it to himself so that he could express himself humanly. So he became a full human being. One person, two natures, and again, the way to think about a nature is a set of capacities. So Jesus, who is divine, and with all of God's capacities, takes a human set of capacities and unites it to himself so that he can do human things. Most importantly, die, right? God does not have the capacity to die, but human beings do. Everything that Jesus does, though, in his ministry and now in eternity, he does as one person with both sets of capacity. So they're inseparable now. That when Jesus taught, he taught with a human body, but that was God speaking. When Jesus suffered and died, that was the capacity of his human nature to suffer and die, but it was still God suffering and dying. Likewise, when Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven to sit on the throne of God, yes, that's God sitting on the throne of God, but that's also a human being now sitting on the throne of God. 
And we remember that it's so important that Jesus is always both divine and human united together because he is that bridge between humanity and divinity. So for us to reach our goal of participating in God's inner life, we participate in Jesus's humanity. That's what baptism does. It links us with Jesus's humanity. Jesus's humanity is united with his divinity and the divine power from Jesus flows through his humanity into us. So this is how we achieve that original goal that if there was no sin, we would have just grown into. But now that there is sin and a barrier, we need to use Jesus as a bridge to get over that sin barrier. Jesus is also going to be seen to be saving us in his three offices. So his first office is a prophet. So Jesus is the perfect revelation to us of the will and character of God. His second office is the king. So this is where when we are united to Jesus, it's transforming us. So it's not just that we are kind of have a bridge to hop the sin barrier, but we're just nasty people now with the power of God. No, to be united to Christ is actually for Jesus's character to seep into us. Jesus is reigning over our hearts as king. We become sanctified. And we'll talk about that more in a few classes. The last office is Jesus as priest. So Jesus is offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. This is where we turn today to dig deeper into this aspect of Jesus's ministry with the atonement. Atonement, the definition, is literally a play on words. It's to be made at one with God. So it, it really just is at one minute. So when we think about sin as a broken relationship, atonement takes those broken pieces and makes them at one again. When you're looking at theology, most topics in theology are answers to a specific question. So Christology is the answer to the question, who is Jesus? The doctrine of revelation is the answer to the question, how do we know things about God? The atonement is asking the question, how specifically does Jesus' death save us? So the scriptures just say mostly Jesus died for our sins. The doctrines of the atonement say, what does it actually mean to say Jesus died for our sins? How does Jesus' death do something for us in our relationship with God? What's the mechanism through which the death becomes saving? Now, atonement is not new in the Christian New Testament. There are images of atonement in the Old Testament as well because people were sinning. God gave them ways to atone, to become back into right relationship with God. Uh, there's two main images. There's lots of little sacrifices um, for sins that are atoning, but they're really footnotes on the Day of Atonement and the Passover lamb. Those are the two main theological images. And if you can make sense of these two, all of the other images just kind of filter down. So the Passover lamb comes out of Exodus. Um, and we remember that in the Passover, God is going to smite the firstborn of Egypt as punishment for the sins of Egypt. Now, understand when God's destroyer comes a destroying, the Hebrews were getting saved, but it was still terribly dangerous for them because. Do you think that the Egyptians were the only people full of sin? No. The Hebrew people were also full of sin. So when God lets the destroying angel loose, everybody who has sin in them is going to get it. How does the Passover lamb work? The Passover lamb takes the place. It is a substitute death 
for the firstborn of the people of Israel. So the Hebrew households kill a Passover lamb as an act that takes the place of the firstborn of their household. And it's an act of faith. They are saved by their faith in the God of Abraham. The God of Abraham says, do this, take the blood, smear it on your doorposts, and because of your faith, because you believe me, the destroying angel will pass over you. So, in the one sense, they're still deep in sin as like the corruption and the stuff that's clinging to them. But the blood of the Passover lamb is a symbol to be seen or a sign of their faith. And so they are spared. Now, I do love this because it shows that faith always requires action, right? Because if a Hebrew household heard God say, do this, and they said, I believe really hard that the right thing to do is to sacrifice that Passover lamb, and then they didn't do it, right? They can't say, well, I had faith because I really believed it so hard. No, their firstborn would be dead. Faith is not just believing in God, but sometimes just believing God. So when God tells you to do something, you got to do it. So this image of atonement is pretty uh, linked to that sense of faith and relationship. So they're trusting in God. God is giving them a way to have a substitute to die in their place. The Day of Atonement in Leviticus is, a, is more complicated and it's more subtle. There's less of a clear, this is exactly how this works. So on the Day of Atonement, instead of a lamb, there were two goats. The first goat, the priest and the community would confess all of the sins of the community over the head of a goat. And symbolically, that goat would then carry the sins of the people out into the wilderness. They would drive the goat out of the camp into the place of demons. Remember, the wilderness was symbolic for the domain of um, the forces of evil. That's why Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted. That is where Satan is most powerful, is in the wilderness. So it's taking all the bad stuff that the people do and giving it back to the source of evil, the devil. The second goat then becomes a symbol of the community. It's slaughtered. Its blood is brought into the Holy of Holies to be sprinkled and smeared on the Ark of the Covenant, on the throne of God. Now, the image here is different than the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb... Um, is very much, it's dead in place of the firstborn. Because the destroyer's coming through, and when you're in the presence of God's destroyer, someone's dying. It's either the sinful person or the lamb. The Day of Atonement works differently. Um, this is not, you know, God's coming in the camp and someone's going to get it. This is, there's an idea of sin as, uh, stinky to God. Basically, God wants to be with the Hebrew people, but the sin that is built up over them is like the cloud of dirt that is around Pigpen in the, uh, the Peanuts cartoon. And much like when you walk into a room where someone hasn't showered in a few weeks, they don't notice it, but you do immediately. And when you go into their presence, you can't stay there. Make sure some queasy, you just want to leave. That's how God is when God goes to the Hebrews and they're stinky with sin. So they need to be cleaned. The idea of the, the Day of Atonement goat is that that blood that is being smeared on the Ark of the Covenant is expiating. It's cleaning away 
the sins of the people. Um, and again, all of these are complex and layered metaphors, and sometimes they kind of mix together. The reason isn't that the goat is dying in the place of the people. The idea is the sin is, again, putting up a barrier between the people and God. How does the life of the people return to God? Well, life is contained in blood. So the blood has to go to God. How do you do the blood to God without everybody dying? You have a scapegoat that takes the place of the people. You have something that the people identify with, so the animal becomes the symbol of the people. That blood is their blood, and it is brought directly to the throne of God. So you have three images all wrapped up in the Day of Atonement. The first is the sins of the people are put on the scapegoat and driven into the wilderness. The ritual stench and defilement is cleaned away by sprinkling and spreading the blood as a, you know, divine, unsanitary uh, perfume solution that goes onto the Ark of the Covenant. But then symbolically, that blood is the life of the people being returned to God. So that intimacy of relationship is restored. They are at one. It is atonement. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus takes on all of those images in a single person. So when you see Jesus and he's called the Lamb of God, that's a Passover reference. When Jesus is called the sacrifice of atonement, um, that's a Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement image. We mix them together because they're all talking about the one person, Jesus. In the Old Testament, very, very different. In the New Testament, they are aspects and metaphors of describing what Jesus' death is doing. Now, on your handout, I've filled in for you point three, because I think this is really important. When you think about Christian images of atonement, it builds on our theology of sin and salvation in the sense that how you view the problem, sin, what metaphor you prefer, and therefore what you see the opposite of that, the solution for that problem is, is going to affect how you see the mechanism through which that solution is accomplished. So we talked before about how there are lots of metaphors for what exactly sin is in the scripture. Some say it's a crime, sometimes it's a debt, sometimes it's a disease, sometimes it's a power holding you in bondage. Depending on what you think sin is, that's gonna affect how you see salvation. So what does it look like to be freed from sin? So if sin is a debt, salvation is being debt-free and being back in the black with God. Therefore, what does the atonement mean? There, well, I guess someone has paid the debt. On the other side, if sin is a disease and salvation, therefore, is being spiritually healthy, then the atonement must be somehow healing you of that disease. Here's why this is really important. Everybody of lots of different theological traditions agree that Jesus is the Savior and his death and resurrection is important. It is the means through which we are saved. But the mechanism by which Christ's death and resurrection do something for us is not laid out in scripture. It's just combined with a lot of these different metaphors. And you see different metaphors talk about it in different ways throughout the New Testament. So theologians have used different metaphors for sin and salvation to construct theories of atonement 
or potential explanations of how Christ's death and resurrection bring us from a state of sin into a state of salvation. All this is to say, this is one of those places where Christians look at somebody that disagrees with them and says, oh, you're just a heretic because you don't believe in Jesus anymore. What's really important to understand is that the New Testament uses a bunch of images. Just because someone disagrees with your preferred metaphor for sin, atonement, and salvation does not mean <laughs> that they are giving up Jesus or faith in his death and resurrection. It just means that they prefer a different metaphor from the Bible. Now, on the flip side, if you don't like a certain metaphor that the Bible uses, that's okay, but you can't completely discard it because it's still a metaphor that the Bible uses. You can say, I think this is weak. That's fine. I think plenty of certain things that Paul or Peter or John says are like, logical stretches. You can be like, I see where you're going, but I don't think you've quite made that case, right? That's fine. That doesn't diminish their place in the canon. They're arguing with each other. <laughs> it's okay. But just know, we kind of, we still have to wrestle with the fact that that is a live option, even if you think it's a bad one. Flip to the back of your sheet. So this is something that I'm just going to use to help us think through the different theories of atonement. And so that you all know, and for the, the video, uh, this idea of laying it out this way, I've adapted from uh, Eugene Rogers and his book, Elements of Christian Thought. So if you, after this course, want to go deeper on some of these, that's a really great resource. Um, he teaches at uh, UNC Greensboro um, in North Carolina, and he wrote that book basically as a book version of the class he teaches to undergraduates. Um, so you'll see explanations of kind of his lectures, and he'll list the text that the students were supposed to read for that class if you want to look that up too. Anyway. So some of these theories of atonement I think are very, very strong. Some of these theories of atonement I think are very, very weak. Um, I'll tell you which ones I like and which ones I don't like at the end. But I'm, for right now, we're just gonna run through them. So the first theory is the expiation theory. Um, and this comes right out of the book of Hebrews. So the author is whoever wrote Hebrews. And this is drawing pretty heavily from the Old Testament images of atonement. Um, most, mostly the um, Leviticus Day of Atonement image. So the conception of sin and the expiation theory is that sin is a pollution. It is a barrier of stench between us and God. Therefore, we lose relationship. So the mechanism that this atonement works with is that Christ, in his death, resurrection, and ascension, offers his own blood in the heavenly sanctuary, wiping away the sins of the world. So it is saying that what the high priest did in the temple for the Hebrews on the Day of Atonement, Jesus does for the sins of the world in the heavenly sanctuary. So Jesus' blood is wiping away the stench. However it worked with the temple, it worked with Jesus. It doesn't get into details trying to explain it. It just basically says, it worked there, it works here. And just like the sins of the people are overcome by that blood going to the Ark of the Covenant, as we get baptized and participate in Jesus' life, that is our blood returning to direct communion with God in the temple in heaven. So what does this mean for us? This means that through Christ, our sins no longer put a block on our relationship with God. So we are no longer stinky 
in God's nostrils because Jesus has wiped away our sin and because Jesus is the high priest there constantly interceding for us, there is no more distance that ever can be put between us and God so insofar as we are participating in Jesus. So obviously, if we just kind of peace out of this whole Christianity thing, there can be distance. But as long as we're participating in Jesus Christ through the sacraments, through living a Christian life, there's no distance anymore between us and God. As the early church develops, for whatever reason, this image is not the dominant one. And I think it's because as we move from a Jewish community who understands temple sacrifices, and that's kind of a part of their culture, into a primarily Gentile faith, um, the temple's been destroyed, that image isn't going to resonate with people. New explanations have to be kind of produced. New metaphors are going to be important. So in the early church, we have two main theories. Um, that are not necessarily in competition with each other. A lot of the early church uses both of these. Because remember, these are images or metaphors that are trying to make sense of things from different perspectives. So the first one is the ransom theory. The ransom theory. Um, and this was developed pretty broadly in the early church. I would say origin of Alexandria is um, a good rule, like author to put down. In your own workbooks, um, in the readings book, this is the theory that was um, in there by Rufinus of Aquileia. So that was the, the chunk that was really bringing this theory out. So in this theory, the conception of sin that they're working with is bondage to death and the devil. So we are enslaved, we are captives who need to be freed. The mechanism of atonement here is really Jesus and God as the trickster. So Jesus becomes human like bait on a hook. So Jesus puts himself out there for the powers of sin and death to come and try to you know, gobble him up not realizing that Jesus being God, it was impossible to hold him. So as the powers of sin and death grabbed Jesus in his death, Jesus then broke out from the inside. So Jesus was like a stick of dynamite on a fish hook. Fish ate it, Jesus exploded them out. So Jesus breaks open hell from the inside. Jesus destroys the power of death and frees us. Um, what this means for us is that when we die, we don't stay dead. So the power of sin and death have been mortally wounded. So death no longer has the right over us. If you guys know um, C.S. Lewis and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, this is the image that he uses. That Aslan, who just is Jesus, when he is die, when he gets killed by the white witch, he says, she knew the deep magic, but there's a magic deeper still. When someone who you know, has no sin dies in the place of someone who has betrayed him, the stone table will crack, death will work in reverse. It's the idea that death itself has taken what it cannot hold, what it does not have rights to, and therefore, it is defeated. The second one from the early church is deification or divinization, to be made God. Um, the name associated with this one is Athanasius. This one views sin as that disease, that corruption of our nature. Specifically, that we are you know, we have a terminal condition. We are sick to death. The mechanism of atonement is that Jesus becomes human and he infuses all of human life with divine power 
including death. So Jesus has to die in order to Trojan horse God into the realm of death in order to infuse the dead, too, with divine power. And that divine power is the power to be resurrected and to participate in the inner life of God. So Athanasius' famous quote is that God became man so that man might become God. Now, capital G God became man so that man might become little g God. But it's this idea of full participation in the divine life. And that much like um, the ransom theory, God winds up in death and heals it from the inside. The difference here is that where ransom really sees death as bondage, that we are captive, more or less deification is going to see what God is doing as healing something within us. So it's an external, internal thing. What this means for us is that we share in God's own nature, infusing us with resurrection power and the strength to overcome sin. Now, I split those two theories out for your benefit. If you read the early church, usually they're both going to be present everywhere. So even when St. Athanasius is writing, they're both there. He just uses them back to back because it's a different metaphor. Because he would say, yes, sin is both an external power holding us in bondage and an internal force corrupting us that needs to be healed. So those two don't think of those as in competition with each other. Think of those as two ways to view the same idea of atonement because they're usually held both by the same people. Now, in the Middle Ages, uh, theologians did not like the idea of God having to do something to overcome the devil. Because in their mind, why would God have to die and pay a ransom to the devil? How could the devil have any rights to begin with? So they have to refigure this. So the first thing that comes out in the Middle Ages is the satisfaction theory. The satisfaction theory um, is written by St. Anselm. And this is where we get the image of sin as a debt, specifically a debt that humans owe to God. So it's not that God has to pay Satan for people. It's that the relationship between humans and God is strained because of a debt of honor that humans owe to God, and we need to get back into the black. It would be unjust for God to just forgive our debt without anything because we fully, knowingly chose to incur that debt. Now, here's where it's really important. When Anselm talks about debt, he's not talking about finances. He's living in a feudal society. He's talking about the debt that someone owes to their Lord. The best way to think about this in today's terms would be like if someone saves your life and you go, oh my gosh, I owe them such a debt. It's a debt of honor. We owe to God the honor of full, perfect obedience. We chose to break that obligation. And so there is a debt between us that we can't repay on our own. Because if we owe God full, perfect obedience, and we are in the red as a species, and you give God full, perfect obedience and then you die, nothing's happened, right? We're still in the red. 
You can't go above and beyond full perfect obedience. None of us have that capacity because we are corrupted by sin. And really, we just keep digging ourselves a hole, usually. What Jesus does, though, is because Jesus is not subject to sin, Jesus lives a full, perfect human life, and then, still in obedience to God, is killed and dies. Now, death is the consequence of sin. If someone is full and perfect, they should not have to die, but Jesus did anyway. Therefore, Jesus is the only person who can and did go above and beyond. So Jesus, God owes Jesus as a human being merit for going above and beyond. The sense of justice that renders punishment to us renders merit to Christ. Now, because Christ is God, the merit that is due to him for him giving up his life is worth an infinite amount because his life is worth an infinite amount because it's God's own life. Because Jesus is human, it is just for God to credit that to Jesus' people, which is the human race. So the mechanism of atonement is that Jesus, by having this infinite merit as a human that he could only earn because he was God, sets the human, sets humanity's debt of honor paid. So we are back kind of in the right relationship with God. So what that means for us is that our debts are paid off and we're square. The second theory in the Middle Ages was the moral exemplar theory. And this was by Peter Abelard. His conception of sin is that sin is a failure to love. That humanity, it's not even a, a corruption per se, it's more of something in our will. We fail to be loving. For Peter Abelard, the death of Christ was the example of what full divine love looked like. That there was like a glass ceiling that Jesus broke. That humanity just couldn't be full and perfectly loving until Christ did it. He broke that through for us. And so now, because of Christ, we too can do what Christ did. So we can be fixed by looking to Christ as our example and do what we're supposed to do. So what does that mean for us? That means that we can stop sinning by looking at Christ's example and becoming like Christ based on his example for us. In the early modern era, we get penal substitution theory. And this comes from Luther and Calvin. And so the penal and penal substitution kind of gives it a way that this is looking at sin as a crime. So instead of a debt of honor, it is God is the sovereign king that you have violated God's law. And a violation of a law requires punishment. So a punishment must be given out. The mechanism of atonement is that Jesus suffering and dying on the cross takes on the punishment that God the Father really wants to give humanity. And then God's wrath is propitiated by taking it out on Jesus instead of us. And so what this means for us is that we are no longer subject to hell or punishment for our sins. Our crimes have been suffered for in Jesus. Now, my take on these, for what it's worth, I think the expiation metaphor is excellent, but there is something lost on it for us because since the end of the temple, 
the exactly how that metaphor works. Why does the blood take away the stinky, and how exactly does that like imagery work? It's it's less helpful for us than it would have been for first century Jews. I think that the the beautiful image there is Jesus as high priest continually before the Father as our advocate. Um, I love the ransom and deification theories. I like the idea of Jesus blowing out hell from the inside and this idea that Jesus came to be with us so that God's life infuses each part of us so that even in death, God's there too. Love that image. Um, Satisfaction theory, I understand. Um, I, my mind, when I hear debt, still always defaults to monetary imagery because I don't live in a feudal society. So debt of honor is more difficult emotionally for me to connect with than just like, we owe God a debt that Jesus paid. But the satisfaction theory is more tangible. So if I'm teaching youths, this is usually where I start because they understand debt, payment, earning things. So it's, it's way more tangible. I think moral exemplar is beautiful, but it falls short because if all Jesus is doing is giving us a good example and inspiring us to be good, I think it under um, appreciates the depth of depravity that we are kind of dealing with. It's a soft Pelagianism, so I think it's like bordering on heresy. But it's a really good uh, theory to add on to some of these other ones. So it, I don't think it works on its own, but it can be satisfaction and moral exemplar, or deification and moral exemplar. I don't think it works on its own. I despise penal substitution because it pits the father against the son and breaks the trinity. So the father cannot pour out his wrath on the son. It doesn't make sense. Um, I also just don't think it works with justice, right? It's not just for someone to suffer on someone else's behalf. That would make God a moral monster. Like, you can understand the justice in there is a debt and someone else pays it, but not there is a, someone has done something wrong and this person over here is going to get beat in his place. That's not punishing him. That's just the state or the sovereign needing to get rid of anger issues, right? I don't like a God that kicks the dog because he's frustrated with his work. Right, that's not a good God. So when it comes to this last one, I'm, I think it is a little bit heretical because it separates the Trinity. But of all of these, that's the one that I think works the poorest. Um, and I think you get all of the benefits of the substitution in Anselm's satisfaction theory without any of the problematic God is an abusive father or an angry tyrant. Okay, that's all I got for you. You can go to breakouts.